Hello and welcome. You're listening to Lore and Legend with your hosts Sebastian O'Dell and Rick Scott. Every week we bring you a legendary tale inspired by the rich traditions of world folklore and mythology. In this episode, Thomas's journey is almost complete, and he hears the tale of a lady seduced by an outlandish lover and his magical horn. This is the tale of Lady Isabel and the Elfin Knight. So we rode, and rode, and hard we rode, we rode fair for a year and for a day, until we came to a great valley that in our path did lay. Thomas and the Queen were now poised on the border of some greater country, the fortunate isle long behind them. What place is this? O oh, to her I said, O oh, please to me do say. Oh, this is Elfin Land, she said, and it's here that you must stay. Not just you, Thomas, but many a mortal has been called away by the siren call of Elfland. For as I heard told, there was once a lady born who was called to this place, which some of your kind call Norway. Well, as I heard told, there was once a lord, and there was once a lady, and they lived in the north country. And they had three daughters. The first and the second daughters, they were both wedded to knights of noble character. The third daughter was Lady Isabel, and for her, no husband presented himself. One morning in the first days of May, Lady Isabel sat in her garden, sewing, and she heard enchanting notes drifting in the air through her bower window, a song which pierced her heart and her soul with its melody. She sighed aloud, and the parrot that sat in the cage by her window asked her, why did she sigh just so? Oh, my pretty Polly, she said, I wish that I had that horn that I hear blowing over the hills and far away, and I wish I had the night that blows that horn between my arms and in my bed. Bide your words, lady, the parrot said, for it is sung. An outlandish knight came from the north lands, and he came a-wooing to me. He told me he'd take me unto the north lands, and there he would marry me. Ah, well, that very night, as the household was gathered in the hall to feast and warm themselves by the hearth, a strange knight rode out of the pass to the north and up to the doors of that hall. Now the stranger's horse was black as coal, but it had two ears of bluish hue, and his hands were of blue skin, and in blue he was dressed from head to foot, and even his beard had a bluish tinge. From his horse this outlandish man jumped down, took up in his arms a harp, and with the strokes that he gave to its golden strings, he played a song that witched the heart. And as he walked, the halls of the lady's house, all who heard the golden notes would smile and sink down into deathly sleep. All that was, except Lady Isabel. She sat up straight in her seat. The music, it thrilled her, and she turned her head to listen to the stranger's approaching footsteps. When he entered the hall, the blue knight fixed his sparkling eyes upon her. He spoke in a voice as rich and melodious as the horn that he carried at his side. Oh, strange it is, oh, strange fair maid, but my horn won't play for me. Unless you call that I play for you, then 
the note rings true in three. So if you would my true lover be, answer me these questions free. Can you sew me a cambric shirt without any seam or needlework? Can you wash it in yonder well, where water never sprang nor rain ever fell? Can you dry it on yonder fawn, where leaf never grew since Adam was born? Answer me these riddles free, and I'll take thee to Norway, and I'll marry thee. Well, Lady Isabel fixed the blue knight with a steady eye, and rising from her seat stepped down to the floor of the hall, and as she did, she replied to the knight, I'll answer now your riddles free, if first you will answer these to me. Can you buy me an acre of land between the salt sea and the golden sand? Can you plough that land with your elfin horn and sow it all with one seed of corn? Can you sack the corn in this small mouse hole and fresh it all in your tall boot sole? Can you hold it in your palm to winnow and sack it all in your right gloves hollow? Can you carry it all across the sea and bring it home all dry to me? If you can manage all that work, then come back here. And you'll have your shirt. Well, at Lady Isabel's words, the blue knight smiled. Then he bowed. And from his sleeve, he pulled a belt of blue silk, which he wound and clasped beneath Lady Isabel's breast. And he said, Come now, and fetch me some of your father's gold. And bound at the breast with the elf knight's charm, his voice cast a spell over Lady Isabel's heart. While her father slept in his enchanted sleep, she emptied his chests of gold. From her mother's chest, she took all her bright silken gowns. Outside, the blue knight was waiting, mounted on his midnight horse. And there was a dapple grey mare at his side, which he had brought for Lady Isabel. She climbed up upon the mare, and together they rode out into the paths of the north. They rode hard and they rode long and on they rode Till it seemed they had been riding all of the night But though the deep sky rolled out over their heads There was no sign of midnight And there broke no cry of morning And they rode on Until they came in sight of a great dark barrow There we must stay this night, the blue knight said For here lives my elder brother and they rode into the barrow fields. And at once they were surrounded by figures who lifted Lady Isabel down from a horse, took her inside the barrow, and sent the blue knight away to sleep in the greenwood. Oh, and that night Lady Isabel, she danced with the lords and the ladies beneath the barrow, which was filled with bright music and the sound of laughter. And they gave to her a single loaf of fairy bread. And they told her not to break the crust until her soul was in such danger as no mortal ever was. And if she did, it would help her. And afterwards, they took Lady Isabel to a chamber, and she turned to sleep. When she woke again, the blue knight stood at the foot of her bed, 
and he held out his hand and bid her to follow him down to the fields, down to the greenwood, down to the clearing where the bright pond stood. She followed him down in the cold and the dark, still unbroken by a whisper of dawn, toward the greenwood's edge, and as she went, Lady Isabel began to feel afraid, so she felt about in her skirts for the loaf of fairy bread, and taking care not to be seen, she broke its crusts between her slender fingers. Inside she found a comb of fine chased silver. They came now to the edge of the trees and to the cool still face of the water, and the blue knight bid her take off her gown and bathe herself in the greenwood pool. But Lady Isabel said, Oh, my lord, my lord, come sit you down. Why not lay your head upon my knee? For you have ridden all the long night through, and weary you must be. So the blue knight bent down, and rested his head against her knee. Lady Isabel began to sing, and as she did so, she ran the silver comb through his long midnight locks. By the art of a song, and the charm of the silver, he fell and chanted into sleep. Now Isabel knew that she should remove the elf knight's girdle from round her chest. She should bind his own limbs with it. She should take hold of his sword. But know what she did. The charm was strong. And while she watched his sleeping face, she found she had no will to fasten her fingers on the elf's braid or the scabbard that lay at his side. The blue knight slept till dawn, and when he awoke he appeared to remember nothing. They mounted up on their horses at once, and they continued on their journey. And long they rode, and hard they rode. They rode through the day and until the twilight, when they came in sight of a darker barrow than the last. There we must stay this night the blue knight said, for here lives my younger brother. And again, there was the strange sweet music, the dancing, the delicate feast, and while the blue knight retired to the dark wood to water his horse and prepare his devices, the barrow folk were kind to her, and they gave to her a single loaf of fairy bread and told her not to break the crust until her soul was in such danger as no mortal had ever been. Well, at the stroke of midnight, the blue knight came to the foot of Lady Isabel's bed and bid her follow him down to the dark wood, where stood an ancient spring called Weary's Well. And as he led her down to the dark wood, she broke the second fairy loaf between her fingers and out fell a golden pin. They came to the wood in the ruin of the ancient well. Then the blue knight bid her take off her gown and wade into the deep water that she might be fresh and clean. But she said, My lord, my lord, come sit you down. Why not lay your head upon my knee? For you have ridden the long night through and weary you must be. So the blue knight bent down and rested his head against his lady's knee. Lady Isabel began to sing and as she did so she pressed the golden pin into the braids of his beard. And by the art of her song and the charm of the gold he fell into enchanted sleep. And once again Isabel made no move to touch the charmed braid or the elf sword but knelt in a trance watching her strange love sleep.
The blue knight slept till dawn, and when he awoke, remembered nothing of the night before. They mounted on their horses again, and this time they rode the longest and the hardest stretch of all, deep into the north country, until they came in sight of a great and dark tower that overlooked the wide seashore. There you must stay this night, the blue knight said, for this is my land and my barrow, and here you shall surely be wed to me. The folk at the castle took the lady inside, but they spoke no word to her. There was no dancing, there was no feasting, and there was no fairy bread. But at the stroke of midnight, the blue knight came to the foot of Lady Isabel's bed, and he bid her follow him down to the shore. And as she followed him, riding on the back of a dapple grey mare, she felt the cold wind blowing over the salt marsh from the sea. And as they reached the sandy bank, Lady Isabel was so afraid that she did not wait for them to arrive, but tried to call to the knight to stop him, repeating her words the night before. Oh, my lord, my lord, come sit you down. Why not lay your head upon my knee? For you have ridden the long night through, and weary you must be. He did not answer her, but continued to lead her down to the edge of the dunes and the salt marsh where the streams met the sea, until he drew up his horse, dismounted from the saddle, and turned his grim visage toward her. Lie down, lie down from your horse, he said and deliver it unto me, for it is six pretty maids that I have drowned here, and the seventh one you shall be. Lady Isabel stared into the knight's eyes, suddenly pale and devoid of their sapphire warmth, but despite her deep dread, she tried to answer him with a smile. Oh, my lord, my lord, what mean you by this? Am I not your wife-to-be? Leave off these jests and lie you down here on the yellow sand by me. But the knight did not relent. Instead, he pointed his sword at her. Take off, take off your clothes, he said, and deliver them unto me, for they are too fine and costly robes to rot in the cold salt sea. And so Lady Isabel turned and slipped out of the saddle. But when she turned to face the night, her own eyes were cool and hard. Stay there, stay there by the grass, she said, and turn your back on me, for it's not fit any gentleman should a naked lady see. For a moment, the knight said nothing, and Lady Isabel thought that he might have been about to laugh at her, but he turned away, sword still clutched in his hand to face the swaying marsh grass, his broad shoulders set against the burning red stripe of the dawn. Lady Isabel slipped off her rich robes and her furs. Fulfilling the blue knight's command, she unwound the blue silken belt from beneath her breast, and it came undone in her fingers. Then with one surging movement, Lady Isabel sprang forward, threw the charmed braid around the blue knight's broad waist, and thrust her leg into the small of his back, heaved with all of her might. Enfeebled by his own charm, the knight stumbled head over heels as Isabel propelled him down the beach and toppled him into the estuary waters. At once he began to sink into the thick silt and the muddy sand. Sometimes he sank, sometimes he swam, and he flung out a hand toward her, and as he did, he begged her imploringly. Oh help, oh help, oh mistress, you're drowned I shall be. Save me from these waters deep, and I promise I will marry thee. But Isabel said, Lie there, lie there, you false-hearted man, lie down in the cold salt sea. For at six pretty maids you have drowned here, and the seven one is drowning thee.
when the blue night had vanished beneath the water, Isabel climbed back onto a horse. She went back up to the castle, where she had the folk dress her in the richest and the finest robes that they possessed. And then she took her horse, and she rode back along the dark pathways of the north towards home. And coming to the yard of her father's house, Lady Isabel had been three days away from that place, but for all within the walls, only a single night had passed, and it was still three hours before the break of day. As Isabel crossed beneath the high window, she was spied by pretty Polly in his cage, and he cackled, and he sang out. Oh, where have you been, oh, my pretty mistress, so long before it is day? And Isabel said, Don't you prattle, don't you prattle, oh, my pretty Polly. Don't you tell this tale of me, and I'll make you a cage, all of yellow beaten gold, with a perch of ivory. But she said, Thomas, you must hold your tongue, whatever you may hear or see, for speak you a word of elfin land, and your own soil you'll never more see. I guess I'll just say a little bit about the the way that I created this tale anyway. So it does come from a collection of ballads um, about ladies who are seduced and carried off by an outlandish stranger or an elf knight. And uh, there, are, there are some other ballads as well which are based around the, the game of riddles that they engage in. Um, but what's interesting is that this... These ballads, even as I was working on, reminded me very much of uh, another folk tale called The Black Bull of Norway, which is about a, um, there was a, a third daughter who isn't married. Um, so she goes to a, uh, a sort of a wise woman, a seer, a witch, who uh, sort of summons up or, or sort of sees into the future and then this black bull appears um, and the, the third daughter has to go away with the bull. And it's a really strange tale that I read when I wasn't as familiar with folklore mm. and it's full of all of these visits to these castles yeah. and the dances and all these kind of things. Um, and because I wanted to create a more developed female hero tale, I kind of borrowed the motifs of the castles from that. Mm. But what's even more interesting is that it's called the Black Bull of Norway. Um, the idea being, once you kind of read between the lines, that there's a husband that appears later in it. And I think the idea is that actually the Black Bull is that husband, mm. uh, that he was kind of like, um, that he was bewitched or ensorcelled and, and transformed into this bull. But you, uh, the story doesn't tell you that. It's kind of, well, again, one of those things that you kind of have to reconstruct. Mm. But it's called The Black Bull of Norway, and one of those uh, riddling rhymes uh, has the elf knight promising that if she answers the riddles correctly, he'll take her away to Norway. Uh, ah, so... There is actually there is a specific connection here between these tales. Yeah. And Norway or Norwa seems to be another name for the elf lands mm. um, in these contexts. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. It's an interesting one for any Norwegians out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you decided to keep the uh, Camberwick shirt bit, the, um, the back and forth of the riddles. I did. All the, the requests. Um, why was that? 
because I cut it out and then I felt like the thing that I like about this tale is that it is a sort of a female protagonist, a female hero. Mm. Um, and I like the idea that she's kind of like clever and sharp and that in a tale which is essentially about uh, a woman being seduced and bewitched by a knight that was quite, that kind of felt important mm. because I wanted to show that she isn't completely naive and this and uh, but I felt I felt, felt like the riddles kind of just added that something extra to the whole encounter it gives you a, a, a sort of extra dimension to her personality but there is that sort of interesting thing that when they complete setting the the impossible tasks to each other, he just kind of laughs it off and drapes her in a silken band, and obviously the band is enchanted, but then they sort of walk off together. Um, she's she's being quite clever, but it doesn't seem like it's accomplishing anything. I think for me the idea is that she's complicit, like the sexy outlander strangers arrived. She wants to go with him. Mm. She essentially, he he sets her a challenge. You can't come with me unless you can do this. She counters, and then that sort of accomplishes the courtship. And then he works his his deeper fairy magic on her. Okay, yeah, I see that. I, see that. <laughs> I mean, in the balance. Um, depends on the version of the tale and some of them it's a bit like that like um, she sort of outwits him with her reply and I think the, the the intention in some of those ballads is depending on which one it is either it's oh I've outsmarted him therefore I, sit, I send him away and I keep my virginity mm-hmm. or um, I'm your equal I'm equal to this I've answered your riddles now let's get it on <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think your the one you've chosen makes a bit more sense because the the setup of the tale is well, I mean it, it, it's female lust, which is actually not done all that often um, in in stories. They're far more often the the object of of, of love and lust stories. Um, but it's very very explicit at the beginning of the tale that she wants him in her bed. Um, I, I read a thing on, on this tale where they were saying that it's it's almost certainly no accident that it's his horn that she wishes to have with her. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and the part where, can you serve with your elfin horn? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Sow all this land with your elfin horn. <laughs> <laughs> and the seed. Yes, um, that was the other one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, so there is there is some significance to the fact that the night is blue. It, it relates to another story. Yeah, well, again, it's like a couple of different connections. So, uh, yeah, it's a bluebeard tale. It's uh, another of these stories patterned on the whole idea of uh, a young woman being married off or sometimes abducted from her from her family. Um, in some tales, primarily from the father, sometimes from the mother. The I think the classic is, a, is a Charles Perrault, actually, who actually writes Sounds the Blue Mid yeah. tale. And there are lots of different versions of that tale that you can find. And uh, and so, the Blue Knight is a the, is a reference to Blue Beard, but it's also a reference to these uh, elf knights in the different tales which seem to take on um, supernatural status as signified by the fact that they are uh, strange colours. Uh, Gawain and the Green Knight, classic example. Yeah. Um, the tale of Greysteel, who is described as being uh, red in appearance. Despite being called Greysteel. Despite being called Greysteel. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we've got so we've got a green knight, we've got a red knight, and this is our blue knight, our blue, our blue beard, blue knight. Another thing I noticed about the story is um, when um, when she comes to the barrows, 
she dances and feasts with all the people therein. They're, they're all supposed to be relatives of the Elfin Knight, uh, of, this, of this Blue Knight. Um, so they are themselves Elfin creatures. And frequently when mortals dance and feast with the Elfin folk, there's always a peril involved in that. They stay too long or they can't ever leave if they eat a bite of the fairy's food. But there, not only is this not actually a problem, these people are explicitly looking out for her, giving her all these charms. And it's an interesting one because it doesn't follow normal expectations about how are the other folk are going to behave towards humans. Yeah, I mean, it's different in every tale, and we do, maybe we've been focusing a lot on negative tales mm. in the other world at the moment, but there are helpful spirits, and I guess in this place it seems like uh, um, the uh, the blue knight, maybe the black sheep of the family, they're kind of like, oh, he's, he's got another one, <laughs> what are we going to do, guys? Uh, <laughs> maybe help her out. <laughs> Um, we haven't succeeded six times, but I guess <laughs> seven times a charm. Well, um, I mean, again, it comes from the Norway tale, where the 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 um, in the Norway tale, the 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 black bull is more is is sympathetic, in fact, rather than being the blue beard character. Mm. So, uh, in that tale, the supernatural lover does love her and his family also seem to help because the witch uh, in the tale basically tries to um, get the husband for her own daughter and it's the, the fairy gifts help mm. out the protagonist at that stage. Right. So uh, it partly arises from the fact that this is my own spin on the tale, but I kind of also like the idea as well. That, yes. Uh, there's a there's an evil spirit, so not, but not necessarily everybody else in his in his family or the world. Uh, and the fairies are uh, are all cruel and yes. uh, and heartless. <laughs> it's it's interesting to wonder to what extent the variation in the characteristics of the fairies and the um, and their magic is due to different stories or different regions, because. It's, it's striking in many ways that there are lots of stories where fairies actually have very similar characteristics. And it's not just one where eating the fairy bread or the fairy fruit will bring harm to you. I'm just wondering whether it's something to do with this being recorded, you know, the Black Ball story being possibly from a different part of the country. That, I guess, I don't know. Scot yeah, Scottish folklore. Fairies are divided into the the seely and the unseely, uh, and basically they're um, kind of like light elves and dark elves. Mm. And the light elves are neither of them are entirely good. Like yeah. all elves are sort of conceived of as being kind of separate to themselves, often a bit selfish and kind of um, neutral in human affairs. Mm. Um, but uh, basically, the the Seely Court is more sympathetic. Those elves are more right. sympathetic, yeah. whereas the Unseely are uh, malevolent. Mm. You know, uh, they um, they're more likely to uh, be responsible for things like uh, killing cattle and working curses and, and all of those kind of things. Um, so uh, yes. I guess maybe the knights from the Northlands and Norway, and um, you know, maybe maybe there is a connection there to the uh, to the the northern mm. uh, classifications of fairies. <laughs> <Is it? laughs> uh, talking of the fairy bread, uh, in the in the Black Bull of Norway, it's it's not bread, but um, some magical fruit that she's given. <laughs> but um, I wanted to use uh, fairy bread, fairy loaves, because there's an interesting bit of folklore surrounding those. Uh, 
apparently there's uh, these sea urchin fossils, uh, echinoderms. Okay. Which uh, they kind of resemble a round loaf of bread. Okay. Um, um, and people used to find them, and uh, they called them fairy loaves. Ah. And they were kept in char- kept as charms, um, by sort of by the hearth, by the fire, as a sort of a, a, a blessing to uh, ensure good baking, <laughs> uh, yeah. and also protect against witchcraft, as these things tend to do. Yeah, in- inevitably. Um, they could also sometimes be called uh, thunderstones, and people thought that they fell out of the sky in a storm, and that if you had one, it would protect you from getting hit by lightning, because lightning never strikes in the same place twice. So if you've got the actual uh-huh. thunderstone that was dropped, <laughs> then you won't get hit. <laughs> lightning is very particular about its locations. If the locations move, it can't hit them again. <laughs> no, quick dodge! Uh, it would also... Uh, it also sweat when a storm was approaching, oh. um, and keep milk and cream fresh. It's very powerful stones all round. <laughs> yeah, so go and get yourself a, a fairy loaf of bread. <laughs> um, keep your milk in the fridge for, for days. <laughs> your milk in the fridge, whiten your smile, <laughs> bring luck onto your household for a thousand years. <laughs> it's not charcoal toothpaste. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another, another reference there is obviously is the, the magic charm, the silken belt, uh, is obviously inspired by the uh, the episode from Gawain and the Green Knight, where the uh, Bertilax lady um, gives Gawain a, uh, a green garter, uh, yes. um, which he has to remove at the end. Join us next week for the final part of Thomas the Rhymer's journey as he concludes his performance to the assembled lords at the Tower of Urtheldoom. Will he pay the price for speaking the secrets of the strange land? You've been listening to Lore and Legend of Lady Isabel and the Elfin Knight. Our story today was interpreted and performed by Rick Scott. Music in this episode was performed by Robert Bentall. With additional sounds and audio from freesounds.org. Full credit for this is available on our website. For news about upcoming episodes and more info about our stories and their sources in world folklore, find us at www.loreandlegend.co.uk or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Of Law and Legend. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, there are a number of ways that you can support us here at Law and Legend. We're committed to keeping the episodes in this series free of adverts, but if you choose to listen to Law and Legend through the Radio Public app, listening to a few short sponsor messages between episodes will generate some modest sponsorship money for us. You can download Radio Public for free on the Android or Apple Store. If you don't want to listen to any ads, please consider supporting the podcast through our creators page on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash law and legend. Financial support motivates us to keep on telling our stories and may allow us to develop more creative content for our listeners in future. If you can't afford to support us regularly but want to drop a few coins in the hat, you can do so using our PayPal link at paypal.me forward slash law and legend. You can find all these links on our website, www.lawandlegend.co.uk.